Can you hear me, Eric? All right, good deal. All right, well, while everybody's kind of finishing up, getting out to their classes, we'll go ahead and get started a couple minutes early. I go till 10.30, is that correct? Um, okay, just make sure I don't go too long. Uh, we'll get started in just a second. Um, before we do, um, let's have a word of prayer for our class. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this day and all the blessings in it. We're grateful um, for another um, Lord's Day that we can come together with our church family and, and with your people to worship you and remember your son's sacrifice on the cross. We pray that we've done so in a way that is well-pleasing in your sight and that will inspire us to go out and live lives this week that are consistent with what he's done for us. And we pray that you'll be with us during this period of study. Help us to take some things from it that are helpful and meaningful to us in our daily lives and that we'll We'll rightly divide your word, and we'll, we'll understand the things from it that, that you would have us to. Uh, pray that you watch over those um, who are sick, and we know we have um, a couple families in our congregation here who have lost loved ones this week. We we'll ask your special blessings on the Earnharts and the Bastons. Pray that you'll comfort them. Forgive us for our sins, and bless our time of study. It's a prayer in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so we are in class number five of our Solomon and the Divided Kingdom class. We're still in the Solomon portion of that, I guess you might say. Uh, Darrell and Scott have gotten us off to a good start, um, kind of just an overview of the books, both of First and Second Kings and Second Chronicles. We've talked about how they kind of cover very similar history. And then uh, Scott got us through, I guess, the first three chapters of First Kings um, on Wednesday night. You remember chapter three, it was when Solomon... Um, gets the appearance from God, right? He's offering um, sacrifices there at the high places in Gibeon, and God comes to visit him. And what was God's question? What shall I give you, right? A anything that you want. And Solomon famously asks for wisdom. And God gives him that, and while he's at it, goes ahead and makes him the richest man in the world in the process. Not a, not a bad bonus. And so Solomon gets this wisdom, and it gets put to the test very quickly, doesn't it? And, and how does that happen? Do you remember? That's right. The two harlots come up, and who, who does the baby belong to? And Solomon, in his God-given wisdom, puts that to bed pretty quickly, doesn't it? And he identifies the, the correct mother and puts that little situation to bed. So that's kind of how we left off um, on Wednesday night. The big part of chapter 4, the, the beginning of it especially, is a, is a real big long list of some of Solomon's officials. And I, I don't have a whole lot to say to you about that. You can read that as well as I can. And then the end of chapter 4 um, speaks about some of the details of both Solomon's wealth and his wisdom. It describes a little bit about the daily operation in Solomon's household, in his palace, in his kingdom. And also speaks of some of the things that Solomon had wisdom about, about all the animals and the fish and the trees and all of that good stuff. And I'm not going to spend any time on that this morning. And the reason for that is I found myself in preparing for Wednesday night's class, referencing back to that section quite a bit. So we'll just take it all at once on Wednesday night. So this morning, let's go ahead and start in 1 Kings chapter 5. Just a quick outline for and what we'll talk about this morning, uh, chapter 5, we'll talk about Solomon's dealings with a man named Hiram, and I designated Hiram the king, and that's going to be an important distinction here in just a minute. He's the king of Tyre, and Solomon's going to uh, create sort of a trade deal, I guess you might say, with him to get some of the remaining temple supplies that he needs. We'll talk about some of the specs for the temple. Um, at the conclusion of our class, there will be a comprehensive exam on all of the specs of the temple, so be sure you're paying attention. And no, we won't go quite that far with it. We will just have a few things to say about those details. And then we'll be introduced to another character that either has an identical name or a very similar name, depending on how your particular text renders it, Hiram or Hiram. I'm going to go with Hiram just because it's different and it helps me keep them straight. And he is a, the master craftsman from Tyre, right? And he's going to do a lot of the bronze work there in the temple. And we'll, we'll talk about some of the things that he does. We'll see the ark finally find a permanent home. Of course, speaking of the ark of the covenant, it had covered quite a bit of ground to this point in Israel's history. And it finally, at long last, gets a permanent dwelling place. And God kind of confirms that at the dedication of the temple. And that's the last thing We'll look at Solomon's speech when the temple is finally dedicated and how the glory of the Lord fills the temple and, and God finally has this permanent dwelling place there in Jerusalem. So that's, that's what you have to look forward to. So let's go ahead and talk about this first section, Solomon and Hiram. 
So as Darrell mentioned to us um, a couple of weeks ago, David didn't get to actually build the temple. He didn't get to be the project manager, you might say. He had made great wars and shed much blood, and God says, you're not going to be one to build this temple. But he did just about everything else, and he had assembled a whole lot of the supplies, you might say, for the temple. In 1 Chronicles chapter 22, you can read about some of those things. But he does interestingly say that there are a few things that he didn't quite have everything that he needs. In 1 Chronicles chapter 22, starting in verse 14, David says to Solomon, Indeed, I have taken much trouble to prepare for the house of the Lord 100,000 talents of gold and 1 million talents of silver, just a staggering amount, and bronze and iron beyond measure, for it is so abundant. I have prepared timber and stone also, and you may add to them. So I got all the silver and the gold you need, but you may need a little more timber, Solomon. And what we're going to see in chapter 5 is Solomon going to get that timber. And David, in, in past times, when he had a acquired some timber. He got it from Tyre, which is just north of Jerusalem, and we'll see that um, in just a minute. You can also read about that in First Chronicles chapter 22 um, if you're interested. So the city of Tyre, where they went to get timber, and when we hear Tyre mentioned in the Bible, it's almost always mentioned alongside sort of its sister city. Do you remember what that is? Sidon, that's right. And those are two they might not have phrased it quite this way in those days, but it helps for our purposes. Two cities within what country. You remember? One empire, Lebanon, right? And what was Lebanon famous for? Right, the, the cedars of Lebanon. Everybody knows where Lebanon, Tennessee is, right? About 25 miles east of Nashville. Does anybody know why it's called Lebanon? Yeah, it's got all kinds of cedar trees down there. And when the pioneers came in, they saw all these and said, hey, this kind of reminds me of some of these biblical stories. So we'll, we'll name this place Lebanon. There's actually a Cedars of Lebanon State Park. If you're looking for a Memorial Day weekend trip for the family, you can shoot on down I-65 and see that. It's good. So Solomon um, is going to get um, cedar and timber from the usual source. And so he sends a letter in 1 Kings chapter 5 to Hiram asking for, for more, um, more timber. And we'll read that just very quickly. Solomon sent to Hiram, You know how my father David could not build a house for the name of the Lord, his God, because of the wars which were fought against him on every side, until the Lord put his foes under the soles of his feet. But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. There is neither adversary nor evil occurrence. And behold, I propose to build a house for the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord spoke to my father David, saying, Your son, whom I will set on your throne in your place, he shall build the house for my name. Now therefore command that they cut down cedars from Lebanon, and my servants will be with your servants, and I will pay you wages for your servants according to whatever you say. For you know that there is none among us who has skill to cut timber like the Sidonians. So Solomon points out, I'm, I'm now in charge here in Jerusalem. I'm David's son. I know you've dealt with him in the past, and now I ask you to do the same for me. He says, I want you to send me some timber, and I will pay you wages according to whatever you say. It must be nice to be the richest man in the world, right? You don't really have to negotiate any terms. Whatever it takes, I'm good for it. Just, just send me what I need, because no one cuts timber like the Sidonians. So Solomon sends this letter, and Hiram happily agrees. He says, I will, I will send you all that you desire. I'm happy that David has a son reigning there in Jerusalem, and I will give you whatever you need. And Hiram kind of comes up with a delivery plan. Do you remember he puts the logs on rafts out into the sea and floats them down to Joppa, and Solomon's servants would pick them up there and deliver them over to Jerusalem. Then we find some, some payment terms there in 1 Kings chapter 5. Solomon is going to repay Hiram with gold, with oil, and eventually with some cities. 1 Kings chapter 5 says that Solomon repaid Hiram with 20,000 cores of wheat. We don't use cores anymore, but I found a conversion that one core, I'm sorry, let me get this right. Yes, five cores is equivalent to one bushel, and we know about bushels. And I think the latest price of wheat is about 11 or $12 a bushel. So this is like somewhere in the neighborhood of $1.1, $1.2 million in today's money of wheat. And it really isn't even a fair comparison, though, because you think about just how 
much easier it is for us to grow a bushel of wheat in, with today's agricultural technology, with the equipment we have, the seed science, the soil science, all that good stuff. The, the, there's just really no, no comparison. So this is a staggering amount of food that Solomon is repaying Hiram with. It just really speaks to the great um, wealth uh, that Solomon had. We'll talk a little bit about, more about those cities on Wednesday night. Um, it may seem at first glance that that was a, a generous repayment of 20 cities, but Hiram was, safe to say, less than impressed with the cities that he ends up getting. And like I said, we'll, we'll talk more about that on Wednesday night. So he's got the supplies, but now Solomon needs some workers. He needs somebody to actually go and and take care of the construction. It says in 1 Kings chapter 5 that he raised up a workforce both from among Israel, from among the Jewish people, and among from the resident Canaanite um, slaves, you might say. They, there were still some Canaanites living in the land with the Jews, and Solomon puts them to work. He finds 30,000 men of Israel, and he sends them in three different month-long shifts up to Lebanon to support the work. They were one month in Lebanon, the scriptures say, and then two months back home, and they rotated um, in that capacity. It says there were just over 150,000 Canaanite slaves that Solomon puts to work, and he has 70,000 of them bearing burdens, 80,000 of them quarrying stone, and then the remaining 3,000 or so, 3,600 I think it is, were, were the middle management, you might say. They were assigned to making people Work. So Solomon makes slaves out of the Canaanites, but not so much of his own people, but he certainly does uh, put them to work. And then there's a man we're introduced to by the name of Adoniram. He's called elsewhere Adoram, who is in charge of the labor force. And bless his heart, he eventually gets stoned trying to support Solomon's son Rehoboam as he establishes his kingdom. But he, he's assigned to the, la the, the labor force um, here. And I would just say this, oh, well, I forgot about my map here. That's where Tyre and Sidon are, um, just directly north of, of Israel. And I don't want to steal too much of Sam's thunder for, for next week, but I just would say briefly that this is one of the first of Solomon's relationships with foreign nations that eventually turn his heart from the Lord. We know the famous verse in 1 Kings 11, chapter 1, King Solomon loved many foreign women as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, the women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, and the Sidonians, right? These people from Lebanon who were really notoriously idolatrous. It says just a few verses later that Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, specifically mentions one of these pagan gods. And we have to believe that it was this relationship that Solomon built to get these supplies that led to those marriages. Do you think there might be a, an application in that for us? Do, do, do we ever go somewhere looking for something that we do genuinely need? Go to work for money that we need, go to school for the education that we need. But then we come back with those things, but maybe also with some other things that aren't so good. You know, maybe some attitudes, some language, some whatever it is. Pro probably a, a, an application for us there. And just to really highlight how notoriously wicked these places were, Jesus, um, in Luke chapter 10, you remember he's pronouncing woe on some of the cities from his home, home area, Bethsaida, Chorazin, and Capernaum, I think it is. And he was pronouncing woe on them, and he kind of needed to come up with a couple of cities to use as an illustration to say that it's going to be worse than the judgment day for you than it is for these terribly wicked cities. And Tyre and Sidon are the cities he chose to use as an example. So um, pretty, pretty notoriously idolatrous places. All right. Anything else on 1 Kings chapter 5? We're going to have to move quickly this morning, but um, anything I'd like to add on that? That's right. Yep. That's right. But Mr. Farley makes the point that should have been driving out these Canaanite people completely when they entered the land, and they, they failed to do that and, and dealt with issues from it um, for a long time. That, very good. All right. Let's look at some of the specs for the temple, some of the, the details that we have there. So again, David wasn't permitted to build the temple because of his great wars and all the blood that he had shed. But he did have the blueprints, right? He had all the plans that God had given him for how it was to be built. In 1 Chronicles 
chapter 28, he has, we find that he had plans for everything, for the sanctuaries, for the vestibule, for all of the miscellaneous furnishings. He had all of those specifications and he passed those on to Solomon and he would build it according to those plans. We find in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 3 and verse 1 that the temple was built on Mount Moriah, the, the temple mount known as Mount Moriah. Now, don't make the mistake that I've made in the past. When you hear that name Moriah, what's often the first thing that comes to your mind, biblically speaking? Do you remember? That's right. That's where uh, Abraham took Isaac to the land of Moriah to offer him as a burnt offering, but it's likely not the same place. Um, at the very least, we don't know for certain that it was the same place, but it's likely different. I sometimes join things together maybe that, that shouldn't be, but that, that's, that is a, a place where we see that name used in scriptures, but it's probably not the, the same hill. But there is some meaningful history that has already happened on this particular place, on this particular bit of ground that the temple will be built on. Do you remember what that is? It notes that for us specifically, actually, in this text. You remember back in 2 Samuel when David offered, made his sinful census, say that five, five times fast, his sinful census of the people, and God was very angry with him. And he was going to punish him. It's interesting, he actually gave David a few options for how he would be punished, but he was going to be punished nonetheless. And in, a, in an effort to make things right with God, he purchased the field of this guy named Arana or Ornan. I'm going to butcher pronunciations all trimester, so don't hold that against me. But he buys the field of this man, this threshing floor, and then he offers um, a burnt offering there on the altar that he builds um, for that sin. So that's kind of the significance of this particular piece of ground. And what happens to this temple that Solomon ultimately builds? The end of our trimester. Right, it's going to be destroyed by the Babylonians, but the second temple, which we commonly know as Herod's temple, also sat on this same uh, piece of ground. Um, Zerubbabel might prefer us to give him a little credit for the building of this temple. He was the one that actually did the original project. We call it Herod's because he kind of renovated it, but that, that's the second temple that was ultimately destroyed by the Romans um, somewhere around 70 AD. If you go there today, you'll find that it's um, primarily under Muslim control. The, the Dome of the Rock sits there, famous Muslim shrine. Um, that's a map of what Jerusalem looked like. Just wanted to show you that it, the temple kind of sits up in the north part. Um, of the, the land there. And this is what it looks like if you go there today. I don't know how well you can see that. Um, that the big gold dome structure that you see, that's the, the Dome of the Rock. And, that, and this picture, interestingly, is actually taken from the, the Mount of Olives, the place that Jesus frequently went. You remember in Matthew chapter 24, he said that not one of the stones of the temple will be left upon another. This is kind of the view that Jesus would have had um, when he made that, that statement. All right, so the temple's going to be built on Mount Moriah. And then we find in the remainder of 1 Kings chapter 6 that we're going to get some detailed dimensions for several of the different, I guess, sections, you might say, of the temple. The, the sanctuaries that we might know more famously as the holy place and the most holy place. God gives how long and how wide and how tall everything is to be. The, the vestibule, sort of the, the entrance of the temple as well as the chambers, the little storage areas, the, the three-story storage that went around the, the perimeter of the temple. And that's kind of, I don't know how well you can see that either, but that's what the, the temple layout, you might say, would look like. And that's not entirely new, is it? What, what is this sort of modeled after? Tabernacle, right? It's, it's very similar, just kind of better in every way, right? The tabernacle was mobile. It was a tent. wasn't necessarily so grand, but this is Solomon's more permanent and much grander version. All right, very good. We'll find that the whole temple is overlaid with gold. A hundred thousand talents of gold, it says that it took. I, the talent somewhere around 75 pounds, I think, so that's a whole lot of, whole lot of gold um, that, that was used to overlay everything. And we'll find here in a minute that everything inside the temple structure, inside the temple walls, was overlaid and made of gold, but everything on the outside was made of what? 
bronze, right? And what's maybe that supposed to symbolize? <laughs> they ordered them the same way the Olympics do, right? Gold is, is better than bronze. Man deals with the bronze and God dwells um, in the house of gold. And so everything from the, the lampstands, the, the tables of showbread, the altar of incense, and then of course the Ark of the Covenant um, was overlaid with gold uh, there inside the temple. You can read later on in the chapter all about the, the cherubim uh, that are fashioned in the most holy place that sort of sit behind the Ark of the Covenant and where it is ultimately uh, going to set. And then the writer tells us that the temple was completed in seven years. It took Solomon seven years to complete this grand construction project. And some of you may be thinking that you've built a house that seemed like it probably took about that long. So pr pretty impressive, especially in those days, to build a, a, a structure that great that quickly, especially when you think about what we find in 1 Kings chapter 7 and verse 1. Two back-to-back -back verses. Remember, our chapter divisions are uninspired. It took seven years to build the temple but it took 13 years for Solomon to build his own house. It certainly seems like the writer wants us to notice that because he puts those verses back to back and I don't want to speculate too much about why, those, why that difference exists. Maybe it was because Solomon's priorities were already becoming a little bit misplaced. He was already more worried about what his palace looked like than the temple of God. I'm not so sure that's true. Maybe it was his blueprints just weren't as good as God's. That's probably pretty possible. I, well, and that's what I was getting ready to say. Mr. Farley said Solomon had too many wives to build a house very quickly. I'd, I'd say when you have to ask 700 women what color paint to use, <laughs> it, it probably takes a, a little while to get all of that figured out. But anyway, it took, it took Solomon 13 years to build his own house. Um, in the remainder of uh, 1 Kings chapter 7, we find some other buildings uh, that he completes. There's the, the house of the forest of Lebanon, it's called. It's again made with cedar from Lebanon and almost built in a sort of colonnade pillar type, type structure that's intended maybe to resemble a forest. And we'll find later on that Solomon uses it as an armory. He's gonna store some shields um, in there in 1 Kings chapter 10. There was the hall of pillars as some have suggested that maybe it wasn't an entirely different structure. It was just sort of the, the entrance uh, to the house of the forest of Lebanon. Uh, entirely possible. It's all gone. We don't uh, really know. And again, this is all set up as a, as a colonnade. It, it's got a roof, but, but no sides. It's all these pillars um, in rows. And so, it, yeah, it's sort of, it's called a porch, right? Uh, the porch of, of the house. And are we introduced anywhere in the New Testament to something called Solomon's porch? We see that all throughout the book of Acts, right? That's where uh, Peter gives his sermon in Acts chapter 3. That's where the Christians came together in Acts chapter 5. When Jesus makes his famous statement, you know, I know my sheep, they hear my voice. He's standing there at Solomon's portico. Again, of course, that's the, the second temple, but sort of built um, after uh, this likeness. Uh, Solomon built the house of judgment where he would have sat to, to try cases as people like those two harlots came to him with, with their problems and he would, um, in his wisdom, make decisions. And then he built a house for, for Pharaoh's daughter. So he had 700 wives, but he built a palace for, for just one of them, for, for Pharaoh's daughter, and she was to live there. It sort of seems to suggest that maybe she was the queen, so to speak, sort of the, the preeminent one of the 700, or maybe she was just the one that drove him crazy and he needed to kind of get her to her own house every so often. That, that could be the case as well. Anyway, I know we went through that very quickly, but we got more things I'd like to get to. Um, in, anything anybody wants to add on that little section? All right, let's talk about Solomon and, and Hiram or Hiram, the craftsman. So when Solomon sets up this letter correspondence um, with Tyre to arrange all this timber, um, Hiram the king also says that I will send Hiram the craftsman to help you with this work, to do some of your, your bronze work. He, he's a master craftsman and he is going to, he can help you with your construction. And he puts together a number of things. He fashions the pillars that are in the front of the vestibule. So right as you walk in, there's, there's two pillars, and Hiram fashioned those. And to go back to our little map there, that's where they would have been. Just again, right as you come in there to the holy place, um, you would have seen those two pillars. And they were named 
Jachin, I guess is how you would pronounce that, which means he shall establish. And Solomon named the other one after his great-great-grandfather, Boaz, right? Do you remember? So Boaz begat Obed, Obed begat Jesse, Jesse begat David, and David begat Solomon, right? So name it after his, his, his great-great-grandfather, and that, that name simply means um, in him is strength. I won't take the time to go into all this, but it goes into quite a bit of detail of the lilies that um, Hura made up on the top and the checker and the chains and the pomegranates and really a, an elaborate and, and beautiful design there at the top um, of the pillars. Next thing we find that, uh, that Hiram fashioned was the sea and the oxen, or the molten sea, you might see it called um, in some other places, and that would have been located, as you see, uh, the arrow points there. It's on the outside, again, made of bronze, can't be inside the temple, it must be on the outside. And it would have looked something like this, a great big bronze basin that's seated on the back of 12 oxen, and they're faced three in each direction, each, each of the four directions. And it was used for the purification of the priests and things like that. It's sort of the, the temple equivalent of the, the bronze laver that, that the tabernacle had. The thing was over seven feet tall. A pretty impressive structure, um, really, especially for those days. Really an impressive engineering feat. Especially, I, I couldn't help but, but point this out. When you think about the fact that it points out that it was completely round. Right? The scriptures say in uh, 1 Kings chapter 7 that the sea and the oxen was completely round, or we might call it a perfect circle. And I think we may have a math teacher or two in here. What, what is the ratio between the circumference and the diameter of a circle? Do you remember? Pi, that's right, 3.14. And what do we know about the dimensions of the sea and the oxen? 30 cubits in circumference. 10 cubits in diameter. So what's that ratio? Three. So when I first read that, I was like, wow, that's, that's pretty close. You know, it was within 5% or so of what we know pi to be for 3,000 years ago. I'll take that as impressive. But it goes even beyond that. We find a few verses later that the basin was a hand breadth thick. Okay, four inches or so thick. And so if you take the 30 cubits to be the inner diameter I'm sorry, the inner circumference, the, all the way around, the inner circumference, and you take the 10 cubits to be the outside diameter, you kind of are dealing with two different circles, right? You have to account for that thickness to get to the inside. And if you make that modification, do you know what the ratio comes out to be? 3.14. <laughs> God was a pretty impressive mathematician. You know, we think we're so smart. Three, here we are 3,000 years later, and we know all about this. It's, it's been there all of this time. So hey, if you want me to show you the little equation for that, I can. But I just found that a very interesting, I guess, type of person I am maybe. But um, one other thing to notice about these is the, the Church of the Latter-day Saints, the, the Mormon Church, they still build these things. Um, and they're temples. Um, if you want to be baptized for the dead, a proxy baptism it might be called. If I want to be baptized on behalf of a relative who has gone on and I want to make sure that their soul is right with God, I can go to a temple and be baptized in one of these things. I'm not sure that I find that anywhere in the 66 books that we're reading here, but I guess they have some additional um, writings that, that they look at. But another, yes, ma'am. Yep. Yeah, I, I think the way that the text points it out is that the whole thing was five cubits high, so seven and a half feet. So I, I take that to include the oxen. I could be wrong about that, but anyway, would be cool to see this thing though, for sure. All right. So here I'm also fashioned the, the carts and the lavers, right? Ten, five of them on each side of the temple. And they were used for, for ritual washing. You can kind of see where they were um, arrayed there along each side um, of the temple. And then, of course, there was the, there's a picture, and then the bronze altar, right? The altar of burnt offering that sat outside the temple. Remember, the tabernacle had something very similar just on the outside. We 
found that it got some action in our class on Wednesday night when Adonijah and Joab go out there to, to grab the horns of it, right? This is the, the temple um, replacement for that, and it was this large structure that sat um, just on the outside of the temple for those sacrifices. It says that the total weight of all the bronze was not determined. There was so much of it, they just didn't calculate how much that there was. And they did calculate that there were 1 million talents or 75 million talents of silver. So I kind of take it to mean that there was at least more than that of bronze. So it's not that they just weren't very good at counting. There was just that much of it that um, just really speaks to how impressive uh, this temple was. All right, anything else? on all that. If I get a good little math review this morning, you probably weren't planning on that. All right, let's talk about the the permanent home for the ark. So as I mentioned earlier, the ark has covered some ground in in Israel's history to this point, and some of its history is a little bit more positive than others. So I just want to remind us of the history of it just very quickly. Remember that the tabernacle was built and it was filled in the days of Moses. We read in Exodus 25 of God's command to build the ark in a certain way and all the specifications for it. And in Exodus 37, that command was actually fulfilled. I take this opportunity to peek into the New Testament just very quickly. Does anybody remember what was inside the ark of the covenant? Three things that the Hebrew writer mentions. Not everybody at once. What was that? I'm sorry. Right, Aaron's rod that budded. The manna, the golden pot of manna, and what else? That's right, the, the two tablets uh, with the Ten Commandments on them. That's right. So uh, we read about that in Exodus uh, 37, or in Hebrews, and um, the ark was built in Exodus 37. And we know that the, ta- the ark dwelt in the tabernacle while Israel journeyed. When the pillar of cloud would get up and move, they would take the ark with them and travel. And then when the pillar came to a stop, they would put the ark back inside for it to dwell in. Remember in the days of Joshua, when they were getting ready to cross the Jordan River and they needed to get across, they, the priests who were carrying the ark stood there in the middle of the water, right? And what happened? The water stopped and kind of a Red Sea situation, right? They, they walked right through. They packed it around the walls of Jericho, those seven days when they got ready for the the walls to come tumbling down. So early on, the ark was, uh, I guess, involved in some more, in some situations that turned out relatively favorably for the Israelites, but here as of lately, um, not so much. You remember um, Eli had his wicked sons, right? Eli the priest had Hophni and Phinehas, who um, were very wicked, and they were involved in a battle with the Philistines one day, and it wasn't going so well. So they kind of thought they had their ace in the hole back in Jerusalem. They had the ark, so we'll, we'll go ahead and bring it out. And maybe, um, may, maybe we'll be victorious in this battle. And what happened? Plan kind of backfired, right? Not only were Hophni and Phinehas killed, the ark was stolen. And Eli didn't take the news too well, right? You remember they came back and told him that his sons were dead, and he seems to take that all right. But when he found out that the ark was gone, he fell over backward in his chair and broke his neck and and died. So, but once it gets to the Philistines, they very quickly wish they didn't steal it, right? It's a very bad thing start to happen to them. They end up with tumors and rats and their gods keep falling off of shelves and breaking. So they're like, we got to get this thing out of here. It's happened in multiple cities. We're done with it. So what do they do? They put it on a cart and stick it behind two old milk cows and kind of send them on their way. And what was their little test? That's right. If they come back for their calves, then evidently this was all just a fluke, you know, just a coincidence. But if they head on back, if they take the ark back where it's supposed to go, we'll know that this is what was causing all of our calamity and what happens. They go right back lowing as they went, the scriptures say, right? So it comes back um, into Israel, but some bad things happen there too, right? The Israelites are so happy to see it there at Beth Shemesh that they get a little carried away. What do they do? So I had to take a little peek inside and over 50,000 people end up dying. God says, you're, you're not to do that. And ultimately they get killed. I guess kind of what happened to the guy on Indiana Jones, right? Happens to them. They just, some bad stuff starts to happen very quickly when they, they open it up. 
So the men at Beth Shemesh says, we don't want this thing here anymore. It's killed 50,000 of our men, so we're going to send it over to, to Kirjath Jerum, or Baal Judah, it's called elsewhere. And that's where the ark resides for a while until King David comes along. And what does King David do with it? He brings it back into Jerusalem, but that trip was a little bit eventful as well, wasn't it? He loads it on a cart and it gets ready to slip off. And <laughs> Uzzah, maybe just by reflex or whatever it is, decides to straighten it back up and God zapped him, right? So that's, that happens in 2 Samuel chapter 6. But ultimately, it finally does get back into Jerusalem and it was dwelling in the tabernacle there until this point. But now Solomon, here in 1 Kings chapter 8, brings it into the temple. This symbol of God's covenant with his people that had been traveling, had been in enemy camps, had been really the, the scourge of his own people in some ways for a period of time, finally is going to dwell in a place that matches the magnificence, at least represents it in the best earthly way that we can of the God who made the covenant. And they bring it into the Holy of Holies and put it behind the veil under the cherubim, and it, it dwells there um, until ultimately Nebuchadnezzar comes in and, and puts an end uh, to all that. Um, yes, ma'am. I had a feeling somebody asked that question. Miss, Miss Linda asked the question that it says in our text here that only the tablets were in the ark at this point, and we noticed earlier that the Hebrew writer speaks of three items that were in there. I would just say that the Hebrew writer seems to be speaking maybe a little bit of the tabernacle days, and it's entirely possible that some of those things were stolen during the, the lap that it made. Maybe they put those items somewhere else in the Holy of Holies. I, don't know if I can give you a good answer for that, but you do make a, an interesting observation. Very good. All right, so they bring the ark into the temple, and they bring it into the Holy of Holies, and what happens? There's a big sign that God gives to confirm that this is where it truly needs to be. The cloud, right? It fills up the temple, and the, the glory of the Lord fills it. And Darrell made mention of this um, a few chapters or a few class periods ago. What happened when the tabernacle and the ark were first constructed? The cloud hovered over the tabernacle. And then when that cloud moved, what was that the sign for the Israelites to do? <laughs> Go where the cloud's going. And when the cloud stops, we stop and we dwell here and wait for the cloud to move again, right? And so maybe this is an image that's intended to show us that not only is, is God here and he blesses this temple, but this is where he's, he's coming to stay, right? The people of Israel have been wandering. They've been, you know, not had a permanent place for God to live, but this is God showing that this is truly um, where, this, the, the, where he ought to be worshipped. And, you know, the presence of the Lord is often symbolized by a, a cloud, isn't it? Can you think about a couple of other um, instances of when that might be the case? That's right. Yep, the, the ascension. You mentioned um, on Mount Sinai when God went up to get the Ten Commandments, there was a cloud that symbolized the presence of the Lord. The tra yep, the exodus, good. The transfiguration, maybe, as well. Good, so God, God symbolizes his presence often by, uh, by a cloud. All right, we've got just about four minutes left, and I have gotten behind on my, well, well, all right, so they have this great celebration, right, to dedicate the temple. Um, Solomon gathers all the elders and the heads of the tribes there um, to, the, to the temple, and they, they do it at the feast in the seventh month. And the seventh month in our calendar would be September or October, and there are a number of feasts that happen um, during that month. It was likely the Feast of Tabernacles, which would, would make sense in some ways, um, but it could also be the, you know, the Day of Atonement or the, the, the Feast of Trumpets. And so it's a seven-day feast and then seven more days, the scriptures say. So some have suggested that maybe it was an expanded uh, Feast of Tabernacles, but I don't know we can say any of that with much, much certainty. All right. And they put the ark in the holies of holies. And I, I did point that out, Miss Linda, that only the tablets were, were inside. You were just a little ahead of me. Very good. All right. So the dedication of the temple, just the few minutes that we have left. So Solomon, like any leader would do that completes a large construction project like this, he's going to give up, get up and, and give a speech to sort of dedicate what is, has just happened. 
And he begins by reminding the people who were there on that day of the Lord's words to David. That God, he didn't allow my father David to to build this temple, but he promised that it would happen. And the Lord on this day has fulfilled its word. And and, and that's a big deal. (laughs) Again, they've been worshiping God in the tabernacle for so long, and now it has finally um, come to something permanent there um, in Jerusalem. He praises God for his faithfulness, for for fulfilling his word, word in this way. And then it's interesting, he goes on to acknowledge that God can't be contained. He said, I wanted to read this just very quickly. He says in 1 Kings chapter 8, start in verse 27, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you, how much less this temple that I have built. So Solomon wanted to make clear that we haven't built a box for God, and this is just where he's going to, to reside. But this is where he is going to intervene and to, to come and have fellowship Uh, with his people. The remainder of his his speech, you might say, he uses this phrase quite a bit, then hear in heaven and forgive. When your people have sinned against you in this way, Solomon says, when they come here before you at this temple, hear in heaven and forgive. When their enemies are um, oppressing them, hear in heaven and forgive. And that's sort of the, the refrain for the majority Um, of his speech and then he pronounces a blessing on all Israel that this day has come it's finally finally here and we can worship God in this place of permanence and I would say to you that in our class um, this is probably our whole trimester this is probably the climax this is like the height of Israel right here things are good God has filled the temple everybody's here together we've got our construction completed everything is good And I hate to say this with three months to go in our trimester, but it's kind of all downhill (laughs) from here. Things fall apart pretty quickly, particularly in the northern kingdom, but ultimately in the the south as well. So I think Scott's called this period the the golden age. Maybe this is just the the peak uh, of that uh, period of time. So I think the bell's going to ring any second. Anything anybody wants to add kind of as we wrap up? All right, so next time, if you don't mind, read 1 Kings chapter 9 on through chapter 10 and verse 13. 9 and verse 1, 10 uh, through 10, 13. Thank you all.